Thanks for joining the session. Um, it's titled Creative Cities 2.0, not just livable, but fun. So uh, I want to make sure that the, this session will be as fun as possible, <laughs> as creative as possible, with your help. <laughs> okay? So we have um, uh, several most creative minds uh, from around the world. Uh, Toshiko from New York and Boston. Uh, she has the two jobs in those two cities. And Jeremy from Portland. And Chiaki from Tokyo. And myself from Tokyo too. So why don't we open up the discussion with the very brief introduction about your own activities around the creative city. Jeremy, please. Hi, thank you, Tak. Um, so my own interactions with uh, Portland um, have ranged from the past 10 to 15 years or so. Uh, I worked in-house uh, with Ace Hotel uh, for, um, uh, for the about four or five years. I helped open Ace Portland, and then my efforts went on to open Ace New York and Ace Palm Springs, uh, building the foundation of that brand. And when we worked on Ace Portland, what was unique about that project was there was an internal creative team that uh, as opposed to hiring out for the creative effort. So we had a very concentrated effort in thinking about not only our impact on the hotel, but our impact in the neighborhood. And so we helped curate a local coffee shop named Stumptown and helped them grow. We helped uh, create a Jewish deli on the corner named Kenny and Zooks. We helped create you know, a, you know, a, a, an event space called The Cleaners. So we really thought about like how this would impact the community as a whole, and it became more of a, a, a full experience in that way. Well, you are titled as a think maker as well as art director. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, absolutely. Um, I kind of think that titles are a little silly sometimes, and, uh, and I also like to get silly. So when given the opportunity to give myself a title at Ace Hotel, uh, even though I was essentially the lead art director, um, I you know, didn't really want, I was like, I don't want to direct art, I want to make art, I want to I make cool things. And so I was, in general, I got hired to do anything that they needed. So I worked on everything from the neon sign out front to the business cards to the blanket design to the record players in the rooms, everything you needed. So I was a thing maker. And I really liked the generic openness of that. And you know, again, this was about 10 years ago. And it was kind of before the maker movement. I think that it was like kind of a, a zeitgeist moment um, where other people were thinking the same thing. And now maker movement is a very established thing. Um, but um, yeah, being a thing maker, I think liberated me from being an art director. And uh, Ace Hotel, well, thanks to his uh, great work, Ace Hotel has become uh, probably the symbolic pioneer of uh, boutique hotel, which is really creative and very different from a typical luxury hotel. And uh, all small hotels are now uh, studying hard uh, how to make that kind of hotel. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next, Chiaki your work around Creative City? Um, my challenge is always very small. <laughs> but I love to uh, find a small change, but that will change the people's way of thinking or way of feeling. So. Like when I visited uh, Ace Hotel in New York, because I had lots of good, you know, uh, was comments about your hotel. The unique point of Ace Hotel, what I felt was use the lobby for the uh, creative people mm -hmm. in that area. Like the lobby is originally designed for to welcome the guest, right? right. But Ace Hotel used the, the best location for the neighbors, like creative people. That was a uh, big surprise to me. Yeah, it's really a community hub. Yeah, but that kind of uh, flame change is very important. So what I do is, for example, Fab Cafe, I learn a digital fabrication cafe in the world, like 10 cities. But the cafe is usually the, you know, uh, the place to have coffee or tea and having good conversation. And Fab, like to make things, or innovation is people think it should be uh, we need to focus or we need good social issue. But maybe 
having fun is a very important element to be creative and to have good idea for innovation. So what we did was con con integrate cafe and fab tools in the same place. And it was actually very successful than we expected. Yeah, not, not <laughs> many people expected that to be a very good success in the first place, right? So you basically overcame the challenge. Yeah, but um, yes, so what we changed is uh, fab machine was for, was people think it was industrial tools. But what I changed was it is a tool for everyone. And we can make many things by ourselves because the concept is we are not consumer anymore. This century, people to be not consumer, but sekatsha, denantindaro. People, human beings. Oh, th <laughs> yeah. Those, those yeah. who make and a good living. We can create things, right. we can create the future, we can create tools, we can create services, not consume only. So that is a concept, and how to install that kind of uh, challenge is what I do. So now, actually, you see a lot of um, housewives, for example, doing or creating something interesting in the cafe, yeah. like every day. Yeah, like housewives or high school students. Or senior people. Or senior people. Senior people love to make a hyosatsu. Hyosatsu. There's a signage house. with your names. Sign oh, yeah, right. of house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they often come to Fab Cafe to make the house and the hyosatsu, their own house. Uh -huh. But high school uh, girls come to Fab Cafe to make own macaron with own message. Mm -hmm. They use laser cutter to put, you know, I love you or sweet messages on the macaron. So <laughs> it's uh, many ways, but, you know, the Fab Cafe functions as a gateway to have a chance what we, we I, I want to make. And, so and you are expanding the network into 10 cities, you said? Like, like which cities? Uh, Taipei, mm -hmm. and then uh, Barcelona, and uh, Thailand, Bangkok, Singapore, and Mexico, and Toulouse, and Strasbourg, Hida, Kyoto, and oh, Shibuya. In interesting selection. Maybe <laughs> I, I want you to uh, explain why you chose those cities later in the session. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Toshiko-san, please. So, <laughs> hi, um, I, I'm, uh, my profession is architecture, and um, I have also been, I think, apropos of this panel, you invited me because I've been uh, serving at World Economic Forums of Global Future Council or Cities and Urbanization. And two years ago, we came up with 10 urban innovations, different ways in which many cities are taking care of uh, climate issues, mobi mobility, and so forth. But we just published Agile Cities, which is a report, uh, it just is one week old, and ho over the press this is the first uh, panel in which I've been discussing it. It's because over the years, in order to make something that Chiaki-san is planning, cities has to be flexible, agile, adaptable. And with the rise of fourth industrial revolution, you can use digital information, digital mechanism, digital tools to make that happen. And those changes are happening very quickly. And then issues of security, issues of climate change, those are something cities need to take action right away. You can't wait till the next meeting, monthly meeting, to decide. Mm -hmm. And so the whole idea is that I think we have an area, one on buildings, and buildings are more, should be designed more like a theater, so that citizen people can perform. And energy, you can actually aggregate, integrate different type of energy sources. Land use, you think more like farmers, in which crops are better aligned with each other to have a flexible use of land use instead of just cutting, making a diagrams and dividing zoning. How do lands interact with each other? Um, idea of mobility, of course, is actually uh, connecting many different modes of mobility from pedestrian 
to public service, to private service, to national railroad system? And how is it going to be convenient? I think in Japan you have the best example that you actually have some such a thing, but not too many other places in the world has it. And IT asset, how do you work uh, agile, agility out of IT asset? Um, education, agile education, peer-to-peer -peer education. Now a lot of people are not even getting diplomas. It's not necessary, and they become completely successful. So it really is a time when agility is important, and also governance to be agile. So the idea is not to come up with strategic planning, mm -hmm. but really evolutionary planning. Mm -hmm. So you are living as a city, as an organism, adapting and changing as you go along and becoming more inclusive, sharing participatory, and then uh, working as if you're a living human being, it's a living city. That's basically the concept behind it. Thank you. Uh, a lot of uh, important issues probably we should we should be picking up later in the session. So uh, let's move to the topic of uh, Tokyo versus other creative cities, like Portland, like New York. Any thought, maybe Jeremy? Sure, yeah, I mean, uh, I think that one of the biggest uh, foundational elements of a creative city is a mindset. Um, really, it's about any place can be a creative city. It, it's, it's not a, a magical formula that one place has and another place doesn't. Uh, it really helps to have um, you know, certain foundational agricultural offerings, for example. Uh, like Portland is set into a beautiful area that's an hour away from the coast, an hour away from Mount Hood, an hour away from the, you know, the gorge. There's you know, an incredible bounty of outdoor activity and natural beauty, and then that leads naturally to agriculture. So that agriculture leads naturally to foodie culture. And with foodie culture, is tied into artist culture. And with artist culture, there's music culture. So it's a really a cascade, and it really builds on one, one another. And whenever you have this coupled with Portland being a second city, not a first city, it's more affordable. Um, there's a lot of area for opportunity, a lot of area for growth. A lot of artists don't have a lot of money, and they need looseness in their life to be able to experiment and you know make their work and it not be contingent on making money. Um, money and creative work are not inherently connected, and they don't need to be. It's uh, gentrification is a natural thing. It does unfortunately happen everywhere. It pushes people all around, and instead of fighting it, I think it's more about how do you regulate it? How do you how do you slow it down, or how do you do it with more intent, where it doesn't damage uh, and leave a trail of destruction behind? <laughs> you know, how can we build on it versus uh, you know uh, thoughtlessly um, you know uh, destroying things along the way? So it really is a mindset, and I think um, it, rather than seeing is believing, I tend to think that believing is seeing. So if you can get really clear on what matters where you are and fan the flames of you know, the embers that you naturally have in your area, it, rather than build a new fire, it's much easier. Can, can you talk a little bit about how it started and how it evolved? I mean, I mean Portland as creative city. You, you mentioned um, foodie culture, art, music. Mm -hmm. All those uh, started together or one started and one followed later? That's a good question. It's, so I'm, I'm originally from Texas and I moved to Portland in 1996. And um, when I moved there, um, st there were certain neighborhoods that you didn't go to. They were just considered to be very dangerous and there wasn't a lot there anyway. You might go there to get one, like a, a, you know, a burrito and then leave you know, or something, but you, know, you don't want to stay there too long. Um, and then there wasn't um, really much of a foodie culture yet. There was like maybe one, maybe two restaurants that were really focused on it at that time. And now it's, a, it's a, you know, an embarrassment of riches. We have uh, too many restaurants. I can't even count them all. And they're all almost always high, high caliber. Um, and um, um, so I think, you know, how it evolved was in lots and lots of pockets of subcultures because I tend to think that the, you know, to, it's, it's ironic a little bit that subcultures are, you know, not uh, respected as the, the most high and it makes sense that they are considered below culture, literally, but they are the foundational elements. I, in my opinion, the, the things that, um, are, that come from a passionate group 
of a very small number of people bubble up eventually and, and become noticed by the media and become a, you know, a, a bigger part of our culture. So to answer your question more succinctly, I feel like there was a lot of that happening in small pockets. There was already a little bit of music culture happening, but it wasn't the scene that it is now. There was already food culture happening, but it was not the scene that it is now. It took drip by drip, year by year, slowly growing that very core, passionate audience. Not everybody, the small like focusing on the minimum viable audience, the ones that really, really care about you and care about what you're doing. Like those people have friends and they'll talk to them and those people's friends, will, their minds will be blown and they'll, they'll fall in love with it. It's about falling in love over and over and over again rather than liking something. And it's a big difference. Interesting. Toshiko-san, I wanna hear from you about. Well, uh, just to <laughs> make a qualifying uh, difference, which is Tokyo is a metropolis, one of the largest cities mm -hmm. in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And Portland is considered to be more regional city. Right. And that's the difference. And what I think is very important is that if we are not careful, rapid urbanization is going to consume all the big cities in the world everywhere. And then I think the development of cities like Portland is significant because it will develop regional development. It will retain younger people to stay in the area and not to have to go to Los Angeles or New York all the time, and then make it a very viable regional community. It's the only way to reduce the rapid urbanization and the population uh, peak, and because big cities cannot manage. I just have to premise that as a very important thing that happened. It's just not an accident, but there was true need of survival for cities. And then creative cities such as Portland was ma able to manage resources. And the resources, what they had, they might have thought was minimum compared to big cities, but they maximized it, optimized it. Mm -hmm. By subculture, they actually made a new value. I think that's actually a very important thing. Okay. And then, New York and Tokyo, very similar, but Tokyo is much larger, but I have to say in population and type of uh, activities, New York is much more diverse. And I think Tokyo has potential because I think Japanese culture, by and large, is highly adaptable. And it has adopted many different culture and it's very open and accepting. Mm -hmm. And I think you can feel a diverse cultures and happening in Tokyo. And I think it does, but somehow it's not visible. It's not presented as diverse. It's always something Japanese, something mm -hmm. Tokyo. It's like, it's too much caught up in its own identity. And I think it needs to be much more open and to be really embracing of its capacity to become diverse. And I think it has an edge about that. So, um, and I think New York is, rough. People are not as nice. It's not as clean. <laughs> Food is not as good. <laughs> so, but we survive. And we, it's, it's got lot, lots of energy. And I think creativity comes from it. But what we have to be careful in New York is rapidly becoming gated community, becoming, meaning it's becoming more and more expensive and exclusive. And I think that's a, really a true problem for cities like New York. Interesting. Chiaki-san, any comment after hearing the two people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I want to ask the, the participants here. Sure. Yeah, because in uh, no, pre-meeting among us, like w we discussed what elements, uh, well, which elements make us feel this city is creative. And like we mentioned, maybe scenery, mm -hmm and you know, natural resources, or food and culture programs, and also people's mind and activities, and maybe innovation and technologies. And of course, you can raise you know, many times, but which elements do you think is very important like creative cities should have, like as mentioned? Scenery, uh, culture program, and people's mind, and innovation. I think the strongest evidence of an emerging creative city is that youth, youth. there's a huge increase in the influx of young people okay. because there's there's a subculture uh -huh. in whether it's music, art, uh, or something we've never heard of. So there, there's a subculture uh -huh. 
that people, young people who love it, gardens, and when you see a, a huge influx in young people in the city, okay. there's something going on there that, that the creativity, the energy, the excitement of what's happening there brings young people. Okay, to. so let's include the youth, yeah. include young people, include uh, uh, people's minor activities. Any other comment? But, Lifestyle. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So people's mind, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you? Safety. safety. I don't know how safety and creativity balances. Um, and maybe this is a question for all for, for you. Being creative is great, but how does that balance with safety? And how do you it's a kind of a question if you don't mind. And how do you create something creative in the hotel or your cafe or even cities? Um, what benchmark do you use to see if it's profitable or not? Because it's, you need profit to be sustainable. Yeah. Um, being creative is great, but if it's not sustainable, uh, what's the matter? Some questions or thoughts? Mm. So many. Yeah, yes. <laughs> the conversation yeah. starts. <laughs> I live in Shibuya. And uh, so um, one area that has been struggling for many years is Okushibu. Mm. Right, which has now become super popular. Yeah. And uh, I would say creative at is measured by the number of new restaurants mm -hmm. with very cuisine, not mm -hmm. just Japanese cuisine. Mm -hmm. So now the ramen shops and the soccer shops are in a minority, and you can eat almost every nationality in Okushu. Right. Well, you are a key member of Future Design Shibuya. Yeah, so yeah. probably you should uh, talk about it. Yeah. So, yeah. and. Uh, Personally, what I feel is, as I always said, um, I feel creativity in the city is activities of, of human. And sometimes young people or uh, like new shops by foreigners or, but new challenges, like when we see that, like how many challenges based on the people's passion when I feel then I feel it is creative, not only scenery or good food, like good food everywhere, good scenery, I think, everywhere, but the people's activity is very important. Right. Yeah, and how to keep the, the space for challenge is um, we need strategy, because as, as you said, we are always required to be sustainable, you means how to make money because we need to live. So how to make money, but I think how to make money often kills creativity. <laughs> That's what I believe. Yeah. Because we have many things to do, but how do you make money kills, maybe I cannot do that. Like not only in the city, but in a company. I have a great idea. I want to do this, may be based on the passion or experience. But maybe the boss asks you how to make money. One million in the two, first two years. That then people think it's impossible. Mm -hmm. But creative city is, I feel something. Let's do it is very important. And for example, I, I, know I studied Fav Cafe. It's a cafe. Mm -hmm. But I have no experience in food and beverage business. So I didn't know how to hire people for the, the cafe. It's different from creative agency. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to price the, the coffee or how to make money. So two years, we are in red. <laughs> but you know, every change is like agile approach. We see which part people like and which part people are excited. And then we will figure out, the we design the business model later. So um, uh, to be creative city, I think low land, <laughs> I mean, cheap land. Cheap land or cheap land? Yeah, cheap land right. is very important. Yeah, I mean, uh, how, to, how <laughs> to make economically sustainable? Yeah. Uh, and one answer to that is yeah. uh, and her, why? her answer. And I, I just visited Berlin last week. Mm -hmm. uh, and Berlin has a very interesting creative town called uh, Holzmarkt. Uh, Holzmarkt is uh, along the Spree River, where a luxurious apartment uh, are be being built uh, by many property developers. And, but a certain district was rent out with a very fair, uh, cheap price uh, to a group 
uh, who created the famous Bar 25, uh, which was the iconic bar Berlin had after uh, the fallen wall. And uh, the, that village is a conglomerate of um, cafe restaurant, theater, a lab, uh, atelier, and a nightclub as a central facility. And a child care facility, 24 hour operation uh, to, to attract parents who like to have some fun at night. So it's a very interesting place and it attracts actually a lot of entrepreneurs from London and New York. Why? Because um, the quality of life is much better because the rent is much cheaper. And also, uh, there is a lot of creativity which gives inspiration to those entrepreneurs. Yeah. Maybe Portland is doing the same thing, yeah. I guess. In certain ways, yes. Uh, I think Portland, um, uh, you know, on the, on the idea of safety, you, you brought that up earlier. I think, it, not to put too much onus on ourselves, but I think it's important. Uh, safety, again, is a mindset. It's like, uh, it's... There are certain neighborhoods in Portland that, at a glance, like where our own office is, um, I, I, I do this because my partner's in the audience, where our office is in downtown Portland, uh, or in, not in downtown, in the, in the central east side district, is very run down in certain buildings. Like certain buildings have been vacated for almost a decade. There's a lot of uh, homeless camps that pop up and go away. There's you know, all sorts of things that, at a glance, don't look safe but nobody I know ever is mugged, hurt, um, you know, like really bothered at all. It's, it's unfortunate that it's a little bit run down, um, but actually it's pretty safe. And um, I think, again, it goes back to the believing is seeing thing. If you think you're unsafe, you're going to probably manifest that in your life over and over regardless of where you live. Um, and you know, granted, there, of course, there are things that the city can do, like put streetlights on the corners, um, you know, have a regular patrol happen, things like this, like certain basic infrastructure, of course. Um, and if that's there, then you know, all we can do is you know, be human beings first and look out for each other, look out for ourselves, make responsible choices. Um, but I think that overall, like, if you can create an environment where people can, again, not focus too much on money and not focus too much on um, you know, being practical, if that makes sense, and uh, you know, like we tell our own employees, if you're not ha if you're not laughing, you're not doing it right. You know, if you, like basically like more laughing, more having fun, it comes through in the work. It's not something that is quantifiable. It's not something that we can measure, but we can feel it. And I think feeling it is more important than measuring sometimes. I, I just want to do some concrete uh, answer to your question. And NYPD, New York Police Department, they came up with a program, started to monitor certain areas where there are repeated crimes. And citizens also contributed. There are some dark corners, there are some areas, and they, without impending, without actually disturbing privacy of citizens, they have created a website in which they are constantly monitoring it. And it's invisible, so you don't feel like police is all over you. You don't see it but it decreased a crime rate by 90% by simply putting information and also citizens are actually giving police these corners, people getting mugged, I see this all the time, and then they just put it in. And then uh, they were trained to monitor it. By monitoring closely, they can prevent it, they can ask, and then uh, people are knowledgeable. So it's completely possible. An idea was that to make that p type of work invisible so it doesn't look like police state, although police is serving the citizens to promote creativity. So that can be balanced really well. In the so that's way. one example of uh, Agile City. Yes, mm -hmm. that's, yeah. a, that's one example of Agile City. Mm -hmm. In Sao Paulo, they did the similar things, mm -hmm. but with regulations, fi uh, firearm controls, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, alcohol consumption after 11 p.m. is prohibited, mm -hmm. things like that. So. Uh, it can be done uh, to balance out. And, and I think you are right. Um, people need to feel safe uh, to be creative. So uh, it's probably a necessary condition mm -hmm. yeah. for a creative city. Well, i like to move on to another discussion, which is um, whether we need to change the definition of a creative city in this area. I mean, Richard Florida gave um, good definition uh, decades ago, but probably the type of creative class uh, need to change. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, lots of lots of uh, global cities, international cities are claiming to be a creative city. Mm -hmm. Probably more than 80, more than 100 cities are saying that way. So um, what should we aim at? I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, I feel like with 
the notion of a creative city, you got to really understand like what is it that makes a city. Um, and really, like Portland is a city of neighborhoods. And I can't say that all the neighborhoods in Portland are creative. They aren't. Um, certain neighborhoods I never visit at all. And it's not because they're dangerous, they're just boring. And so they're, they're just not creative. And But so to, then to call Portland a creative city is very reductionist. It's a very reduced way of understanding the city. It's like once you're, you're it's, it's a, a very outsider's perspective of Portland. Once you're an insider of Portland, once you're there living that life and you understand the city, you understand where to find the creative things that you are into. You know, again, it goes back to that passionate small group. And, you know, and even with all the creation and all the things happening, I'm not plugged into all of it. Like, it's impossible for, in one person. Like, I can't be a part of all of it. And I don't want to be a part of all of it. I want to be a part of what I love. And that's it. And, and I want to encourage others to think the same. You know, they don't, like, there's no right or wrong. It's more about, like, what's relevant or what's not relevant. So I feel like in that way, any city can be a creative city. And right. it's a matter of, uh, you know, again, attracting and, and encouraging the right mentality and right people to yeah. start with. Absolutely. So maybe adding to Jeremy's comment, uh, our, maybe our generation, maybe some people are much younger than I, but our generation, we tend to think how to differentiate the, the city, each other. But new generation, like young people, focus on they are similar to each other in the world. And and the topics they are discussing is, for example, uh, food sustainability, or how to keep and acti uh, activate their own culture in each country or each area, and like communication. Because I started Hyakubanji, it's a project space for people who are under 35 years old. In Shibuya. In Shibuya. And we don't charge any rent. Uh, but we choose a project which sounds creative or interesting. And then we almost selected about 80 projects last year. Wow. But then category, like, when we see the all project, then they have focus. Like, they love insect food. But they are quite serious. Like how to eat the most convenient and uh, efficient resource in the grove. How to eat insect in a good way. It's, they are very professional. Like insect ramen, it's very popular. So food sustainability, they don't care about Michelin actually. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> yeah, and then they care about uh, flexibility. They are not interested in buying house, mm -hmm. but instead they build a, a mobile house and they want to move on their own mission. We want to work here with a good scenery or good food or good environment, and then move. So they want to challenge the, the law of uh, possession of the land, for example. And, and, also and they are also interested in sharing everything. Yeah, sharing. So, and I think that's all happening in the world. So, like Creative City, of the next generation could be not differentiation, but the more integration of the, yeah, the network, global network uh, of creative, creative people, yeah. yeah, I think. Toshiko-san, any comment? About uh, creative city? Creative city. Well, I think you mentioned that young people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and young people are creative because ignorance is bliss. <laughs> Let's face that. And I think that's we should encourage them because Otherwise, there are so many in impediments. You can't do this, you can't make money, this is not safe. And I think, in a way, the culture that allows uh, failures, that allows uh, experimentation, I think that's where a lot of uh, creativity can thrive. And it's strange, because art artists and scientists both experiment quite a lot, and they don't Bother. They don't be bothered. They don't call them failures. They just call them experiments. And then sometimes they actually succeed, sometimes they don't. So I think that's issues of culture and issues of interact society and society values. And then also uh, what, what is critical is that some cities are behind in terms of digital culture. And as we talked about, some cities we visit, we like, are attractive, but they may not be behind because technologically they haven't caught up. And I think that's probably 
uh, because <coughs> failures, if there's one about the city, to not to catch up and to be immersed in it. Um, I completely agree, and I have uh, actually one one thought that that uh, you spurred, which was um, helping shift uh, m not a local mindset exclusively, but starting with local, from the idea of more to the idea of better, because I think we've been in decades and decades of like when when a company exists, it's like a, a, a common mantra to hear: if you're not growing, that means your company's dying. I don't believe that. Like we're almost 10 years old as a company and we're intentionally small, we're 15 people. We have many opportunities to grow bigger than that. We've chosen not to. And it's a, it's a matter of being very intentional with, uh, instead of simply contributing more, which ultimately causes, if everyone in here spoke at the same time over each other, it'd be a lot of noise. But if you can contribute something better, then please do, you know? Like, and so I feel like that is a big shift, a big cultural shift that's not local to America, it's not local to, to Japan, it's, it's a global phenomenon that I think, if anything, Japan is probably more clued in, in on it than a lot of countries uh, in the sense of like less but better. You know, it's a very Dieter Rahms kind of mentality. And maybe we should also include diversity as a key enabler. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, diversity uh, just n inherently will bring different points of view. And with different points of view, you simply can understand something in different ways. And by having that perspective, you have more choices. And by having choices, you can be more intentional. So absolutely, again, it's a cascade effect. By the way, I want to hear from you again. Um, how many of you think that the Tokyo is a really a creative city? Raise your hand. A lot, or oh, not so many? Okay. Uh, I think Tokyo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think Tokyo has. All, I mean, all of my designer friends love Tokyo. Right. They love coming here. I think, just like Jeremy said, there are a few neighborhoods in Tokyo that I would pinpoint. That I would pinpoint as the creative neighborhoods. And like the city is just a big city. Like in in New York, Brooklyn is a very creative part of town, and Soho, before it gentrified, was a very creative part of town. I think Okushiba is Okushibu is one. Um, <clears throat> I think Harajuku remains uh, an extremely diverse, even though it's all Japanese, it's extremely diverse personalities, extremely diverse fashion tastes. Yeah. Harajuku is still very much uh, a hub of creativity here. Yeah. Uh, and any of, any of the communities, Kanda, where, where the students, the, the stu universities are and the students and the poorer, older, rundown neighborhoods, plenty of creative parts of town. But the, the, and the city itself, creative, but there are boring neighborhoods in Tokyo just like there are boring neighborhoods in Portland. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, the, the Monocle, the, the British lifestyle magazine, has rated Tokyo as the number one um, livable city uh, in a row between 2014 and 2017. Uh, this year, actually, uh, Tokyo is rated number two after Munich. Wow. But still, um, some segment of people outside of Japan believes Tokyo to be a really creative and livable city. So let's talk about the future of Tokyo. Any suggestion, ideas? Um, any suggestion, ideas? As an, I'm a, as an architect, I'm really shocked how little the city commissions to Japanese young architects for the buildings. Mm. And I think Japan has the biggest number of winners of a major prizes, contemporary architects. It's the number one architecture as a value asset export, but they don't use them. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Tokyo as a cityscape is very ugly, mm -hmm. to say the least. Mm -hmm. I mean, the buildings are done nicely, but incredibly, how do I say, um, corporate looking. Mm -hmm. So. I think this city and the country has capacity and talent to make amazing cities, and why can we not commissioning them? Mm. It would be amazing to have all these contemporary architects who are winning <coughs> prizes everywhere to do all sorts of different buildings, and it would be like incredible, it would be that top city, and it would be probably fun and livable, creative. It would send a message it's a creative city. I think Tokyo sends a message as an image, a corporate city. And I think that's really a problem because it survives, goes street level, it's great. But if you look up above, it's not great. Mm -hmm. So. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie. 
I think because um, <laughs> still Tokyo is a business driven city. Yeah. So when they build a tall building, New York too. Yeah, like New York it's too, but it's yeah, but established people in Japan love foreign brand. So many big buildings are commissioned to foreign architects still in Tokyo. It's, that's uh, identity yeah. crisis. I yeah. think they shouldn't really. <laughs> because from France, from New York, we love that. Yeah, anyway, I, 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 think, I think it's not only about the selection of architects. It's also about probably the guidance from yes. the municipal government about uh, the capacity, allowance, and the property developers uh, have an inclination to maximize the use mm -hmm. of the land or capacity. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably they, they need to be given giving a different kind of guidance to the property developers yeah. to develop a town like Shibuya, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, but um, as a strategic way, approach, is let's think as a portfolio, not a single building. Because the main street, maybe you know, we need to build international building, maybe international architects, American architects. No, like we don't have to, has. I think. <laughs> because Japanese <laughs> architect is already international. Yeah, yeah. but you know, a famous architect. But what it do doesn't you have to be famous. <laughs> it has to be I creative. don't like it. Yeah, but I don't like it, but it's happening. But let's like resist that. Let's yeah. Speak up against it. Yeah, but the, our registration is one block behind the main street is our area, because the price of the land dramatically sharp. Only one street. That is unique point of Tokyo, especially in Shibuya. So we focus on. Let's focus on that area. Of course, fighting the main street. Maybe I asked. Toshiko-san to do that, like change the government. But our quick and doable approach is change from the, the, the next, you know, small yeah, streets. The streets That's are really important. We yeah. can do many experience, and actually many interesting cafes or buildings are happening. So maybe change from subculture mm -hmm. to and mainstreaming mm -hmm. will be done by Bottom like up. you, yeah, Bottom Bottom up. Up, yeah. Exactly. So do yeah. that's Shibuya's uh, experiment, including public area. So, so we need to be more radical about the use of streets and uh, yeah. public spaces, mm -hmm. which Japan has not been good at. Yes. So, but your your comment about Tokyo. Yeah, I mean, just to just to continue that thought, I, I feel like asking the question, "What is this for?" is a really important question to ask. That's what we asked ourselves when it came to hotel lobbies. That's what we asked ourselves when it came to hotel rooms, to anything. We're just like, I, why don't I like hotels? Like, that's really where it all started from. I didn't like them. My part, my, my own, the, the owners of the hotel didn't like them. And, we're, and we started asking ourselves, well, why don't we like them? And what, what kind of spaces do we like to be in? And so can we bring those elements into a hotel? And sure enough, it was residential co combined with hospitality. And it was that simple. And no one was doing it. And so luckily, you know, none, none of us had a hotel background. So none of us had to do it a certain way or the right way. We just did what we wanted to do. And it worked. Um, but so I'm, I'm going to say something that's uh, not controversial here necessarily, but I almost feel like Tokyo doesn't need to improve because I think there's momentum here already. I think, as you mentioned, it is clearly a metropolis, clearly a global city. Clearly, it's going to have those embers, those coals that you can fan those flames forever already, and you should. I feel like Tokyo is in a position to help other second cities instead start to grow. And I think that's what Portland was. You know, Portland uh, years ago tried to make the mistake of copying Seattle, tried to be like Seattle, and it didn't work. And, you know, and once Portland stopped doing that and started fanning its own flames, it became more popular, more creative, and more well-known than Seattle is. So that's my take is that the future of, of Japan is not in Tokyo alone. It's Tokyo and other second cities. Thank you. So I want to take uh, your comments and uh, questions. And, uh, probably I should have said that earlier. Toshiko, Chiaki, and myself are a part of the team called Next Tokyo, uh, which is a team, pro bono team, uh, to develop a future city vision for Tokyo in view of uh, 2020 and beyond. And I work with the several property developers on uh, the real town development projects 
and also work on the, some deregulation uh, issues. So uh, we like to hear from you about your perspective as well as uh, uh, your suggestions. 30 minutes comment, questions, please. Uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah, it's, another, uh, it's another side of creativity, I think, to come up with smart solutions. Uh, I think uh, Tokyo and Japan is probably the most structured country in the world. Look at the traffic situation. You are around 30 million people here, and compare with Sao Paulo, 30 million people, and it's just impossible to drive a car two blocks. So I think uh, what you said, uh, you have to learn from Japan, uh, you know, when you build cities uh, and mega cities around the world to really have, have uh, Tokyo and Japan as a role model. Thank you. Any other comment, question? Please. And, and you, after that. I went to the Silicon Valley uh, two years ago. And there are, uh, I feel that, uh, I felt that uh, everybody escaped to the concrete jungle in the downtown of the San Francisco. This trend beca uh, came to the Tokyo or Japan. What do you think? One of the reasons why we love coming to Tokyo is the fascinating subcultures that exist here. Uh, one of the senses that I get is that Tokyo may be a little embarrassed by some of the subcultures. Uh, they're not promoted uh, very well. It's really hard as a Westerner to find those activities. And uh, I think it would be interesting uh, thinking about the future of Tokyo, of how you can promote those small subcultures so Westerners can find them more easily. Thank you. Uh, in London, where I used to live, in Portobello, there was a, a young man who built a creative workspace, a very large building that, uh, uh, where he rented out cubicles to creative businesses that allowed for young people with creative ideas to inexpensively, uh, uh, in a trendy uh, communal workspace, to uh, build, start businesses. I, I've not seen that kind of uh, architecture in uh, Tokyo. So I was wondering whether uh, the municipality or um, private developers can or should go down that road. So um, at least there were two questions, so mm -hmm. anybody can pick up one of them. I'm trying to remember exactly what his question was. The Silicon Valley? Uh, escaping the concrete jungle, right. yes. Um, uh, so yeah, so escaping the concrete jungle. Um, I think that that absolutely happened uh, with Portland as well. Uh, people, you know, uh, are fleeing LA and San Francisco so much coming to Portland that it's a really common feeling in Portland to be like, no more Californians. And it's like an unfair, it's an unfair bias, <laughs> but, uh, but it's real. I mean, you'll hear it from everybody. And I'm, you know, like there's most people from Portland that you that are in the creative community are not from Portland. They're from somewhere else. So it's a terribly ironic thing for them to say. And like myself, I'm from Texas. It's not, I'm, I will never say no Californians. It's not fair. Like, it's like, I'm also an immigrant. It's like, it's I need, like, we need to welcome the right mentality. And so, um, I, you know, escaping the concrete jungle, it kind of just dovetails from what I was mentioning earlier, is I feel like, you know, and I agree with Evan with what he mentioned earlier about, um, you know, helping promote the, the subcultures within a, within a city like Tokyo or, uh, or you know, uh, London or, you know, anywhere that, you know, New York or, or Tokyo is, is always important. But creatives are always going to be naturally drawn to, you know, that, that underground thing, that new undiscovered thing. And so, you know, right now in, in America, like Detroit is a city that is, has been dead forever. And because it's dead, that means there's tons of opportunity. There's tons of buildings that are super cheap and really cool. And creative. And, and really yeah, creative. creative and, but it's not a popular place. And it probably is a little dangerous, to be honest. And so all of these things, like, you know, is, it fosters creative growth. Like the artists will move there. They will make it cool. And then other people that have money to buy art mm -hmm. <laughs> will follow and then the artist can't afford it anymore and they'll move so and that just happens over and over and over so how can we slow that cycle down how can we make it more sustainable those are bigger questions I don't really have the answer to that but I think that there is something to that that same thing is happening in Brooklyn too so Absolutely. Brooklyn used to be 
the kind of equivalent of Portland in the east, but now it's becoming so expensive. Mm -hmm. So, so they are actually escaping Brooklyn concrete jungle, and they are going up Hudson Valley. In Hudson Valley, they are buying small plots and small cabins, and mm -hmm. they are doing creative workspaces up the Hudson River. So, yeah. so Toshiko-san, you are always talking about the use of temporary structure right. to make the city more attractive. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's part of agile, right. uh, about land, agile land. And related to your, your question, uh, about work you space. raised yes. about in, London. In, I, I don't know what's happening in Tokyo, but in New York, pop-up shops are very, very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, very, uh, like a one month, two months, three months, very short-term retail. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, a lot, lot of uh, even pop-up schools and pop-up exhibitions, mm -hmm. and that's the idea of a temporary. It has been really a very key driver mm -hmm. because one is it, it's actually very expensive, ha huge overhead to do a permanent structure, mm -hmm. and its occupancy rate and then exhibition, it's not really uh, feasible. Talking about your question about how do you make creativity mm -hmm. financially feasible, this was an answer. Why do they don't need a same exhibition for one year, but they can have three days, but then instead of uh, one artist, you can have 30 people for 90 days, mm -hmm. and that actually promotes the dynamism and people come back to visit more, mm -hmm. and then it uh, actually promotes the economy in that way. So I think this idea of a time, uh, uh, really understanding not only the space, but time, and how to use time well yeah. in a rapid economy is actually probably key to yeah. creative places and yeah. cities. I totally agree on that, and especially the, the cost of management is becoming much cheaper, uh, empowered by technology. Because so we used to think, you know, many things as a full time, like how to use this space mm -hmm. for education mm -hmm. or for restaurant. But maybe for the morning or during day, night, midnight, we can, ch you know, add many layers for one space. That is new business model of, you know, technology driven era, I think. And for example, we have Sust like permanent temporary uh, patissier at Fab Cafe. Mm, right. So it's temporary, but regular. <laughs> so if she tried to become a, a patissier, full-time patissier, mm. she has to care about the uh, genka, how much cost of uh, fruits or something. Cost she, of goods. Yeah. But she works as a patissier every month for the two weekends, she becomes really popular, makes money, but she works the other time as a software engineer. So that kind of portfolio uh, usage or lifestyle becomes more popular and mainstream. That is, uh, you, you know, new approach and to you can become more key creative. creativity, yeah. like not only business, but combining business and culture, mm -hmm. a new challenge. Oh, may maybe I want to ask you again uh, another question about the relationship between uh, creativity and entrepreneurship, or creativity and business. Well, some people tend to think those two very different, but yes, please. Um, I make sourdough, and uh, I put sake kasu in the sourdough, and I give it to my shareholders. They're so happy. <laughs> so while I'm busy building the business and not uh, making money yet, I give them sourdough as a thank you. <laughs> so that's a connection. And, and keep them happy. And keep them happy. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe being happy was the key theme among us. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think that, uh, again, you can, it's not a measurable, you know, ROI, but, you know, you can feel the joy in the work, uh, and you can also feel when it's not there, and I think that that feeling is what people ultimately are buying. They're, you know, yes, they're buying a product, they're buying a service, but really they're buying the idea of that product. They're buying the idea of that service. It's an extension of themselves. So that, when you in imbue something, you know, like my grandmother always cooked food with love, and, and she really did, and it, you could really taste it. So, and and so I, I, in turn, do that same thing. So if you put yourself into the work, and if you really actually care about humans, not consumers, but humans, it's a very different term. I, I really try to strip that language away from 
uh, as many um, you know times that we speak internally about like our clients, like they're people, like we're helping people, and our vehicle to help people is design. And you know, the, the, you can help people in lots of ways, you know, but we just happen to be using design, and that's what I really get out of bed for every day. And um, I think that the more people that can just really understand what gets them out of bed in the morning is a really helpful thing, and, and being uh, joyful is absolutely critical to good creative. Thank you. Uh, I think it's coming to the time for closing comments, so I want to get a comment from you, Chiaki, and Toshiko, then, please. Um, I'm very much interested in how to install the framework to welcome different point of view. So as the last session, I listened to the, the Niseko's um, example. Niseko was something that Japanese couldn't design. It's the trigger was foreign point of view. We always, knew, uh, we always need new approach to update the, uh, the current status. But having many you know, uh, politics and uh, people's voice, we cannot find the new approach. So how to install the function that welcome new people? And that was also one approach what I did was having cafe and welcome everyone to use the machines. But many other new functions that is not permission based, but always welcome. That if we can install that kind of functions, as many as possible in Tokyo, then I think Tokyo will become more creative. Um, about creative city, as you mentioned, it's cities are not really machinery. It's really made out of humans. And more and more, I see younger people, millenniums and even younger ones, demanding a lifestyle choice. And they would actually go for the lifestyle we want rather than conforming with what's existing. That they realize, I realize, getting older, life is short. And we really uh, go for quality. I think younger people are very careful about the choices they make. And I think this value issue is a lot to do with creative cities, in which they will come up with not single value, multiple values, but that aligns, has aligned with the way they live. So that's actually what will make a successful and creative city possible in future. Thank you so much. Um, I think we heard a lot of uh, important keywords today. I picked up several, including cities can be agile to, to solve uh, issues um, with the fairly low cost. Um, cities need to embrace um, unique and attractive lifestyle to attract the right kind of people. And uh, cities need new perspectives from new people uh, who come from other cities or other countries uh, to, to uh, instill a new way of innovate the city. And also to be creative, it requires a tolerance for failure. So maybe that's, that's something Japan really needs to change. Well, thank you very much again. Um, please give a big applaud, applaud to the panelists. Thank you.